Hi everyone. Um, I might make a start because, uh, yeah, it's time-ish and milling looks like it's subsided. So, uh, yeah, I'll make a start. Um, so, hello, uh, my name's Elena. Um, I work for the Public Interest Research Centre, a small organisation based in Mid Wales. Um, my two disclaimers at the beginning, um, which I feel like I have to say here, are I'm not in the health sector at all. <laughs> um, and I'm also not really a campaigner. So um, uh, the uh, title of this session is to some degree rhetorical, <laughs> or I'm gonna pass it back to you in terms of like, how do we campaign for universal healthcare really? Um, but uh, I'm hoping to make the case that uh, an understanding of human values and um, the social psychology of human values and an understanding of framing um, is a kind of important part of the puzzle, basically. Um, uh, yeah, so my organisation and I have been working uh, on an initiative called Common Cause for the past uh, four or so years. Um, it was basically a, well it started as a report um, that came out of WWF that was born of a frustration about the fact that we're facing these huge global issues and the scale of the, prob the, the, scale of the solutions that we are proposing or the scale of the solutions that we are managing uh, aren't proportionate to those, to those problems. So very similar to what um, I think Thomas was just saying before and some of the other speakers. Um, we make these little gains basically and we and and that's great and those little gains shouldn't be sniffed at but there's these huge problems that we're not quite facing um, and basically since that point common cause has kind of spread into a whole load of other sectors and has underpinned a number of campaigns and has started a whole load of other initiatives um, anyway uh, the main point of it really is that uh, Understanding values and understanding the common values that we all share um, can help us uh, build a foundation for uh, creating connections between all of these issues. And it's really nice to be here at MedAct because MedAct is definitely, or at the MedAct conference, because MedAct is definitely one of those organisations that is creating those connections and recognising that there are those connections between issues. Um, so I guess the point is that through that report and through uh, these kind of investigations into social psychology, um, the, the kind of conclusion is that values can help us answer some big questions. So how do we create a more democratic world, a more sustainable world, um, a world in which people have higher well-being, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I'm going to, yeah, basically just give you an introduction to these things. Um, values. Uh, I'm going to kick it back to you to start because uh, we've just sat and listened to lots and lots of stuff and I think that it's important to get brains ticking over. Um, so I'm going to give you a couple of minutes to talk with your partner, some your neighbour, um, about what you value, what you value in life, what's important to you. Uh, and I'm going to give you about three minutes and then I'm going to ask you to tell me some of those things. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I'm not sure who's better applied to the process where we start up with Yes. So, sort of the, the, the basic practical needs of the film. I've the fact that I'm going to give you another minute, so if not everybody has said something, make sure somebody else gets to say. Yeah, stop. <laughs> 
Um, so, uh, a researcher called Shalom Schwartz published a paper in 1992. Um, it was an amalgamation of a load of research in which they had basically gone and asked lots and lots of people exactly that thing. Um, so, uh, the paper reported on surveys from 65 different countries across the world. Um, it was uh, about 65,000 surveys altogether, um, and it's a survey that is now carried out every two years in the European Union. Uh, so uh, I think it's 2,000 people from each, from each of 25 different countries. So that's uh, 50,000 surveys of them every single year. And basically, uh, this was the list that they came up with. It's 57 values. Um, and it was a kind of condense, condensing of like all of the answers that people would give. Um, and yeah, you basically get this list. Um, and you might find things that you've said, and you might find things that uh, are fairly similar to what you've said. Um, yeah. That's basically the list. Um, values basically are motivations. Values are what guide us. They're not characteristics. We sometimes use really similar language to talk about characteristics or outcomes or uh, yeah things, objects. Um, but but when we talk about values, they're the they're the kind of underlying motivations. They're kind of guiding principles in our lives. Um, these are values that we all share. This list, uh, as posited by Schwartz, is a list of things that we all. Uh, value to some degree, it's just that we value them slightly differently. 
um, they're not always conscious. So we might not always recognize that we value something. They're often quite abstract. They're often like ideals that we don't really think about, but they do guide the way that we think and act. Um, so we might not really think about the fact that we really value friendship, but it does guide the way that we act towards other people. Um, and values also transcend specific actions. So um, what makes a value different from an attitude is that it isn't just um, something that applies to one specific thing. If you value equality, it's likely to guide a whole load of other things. It doesn't just guide the way that you behave in one particular way. Um, one more question for you. So what problems do we care about in the world? What are the global issues that we are really concerned about? Global warming. Global warming and the impact of that on the environment, on health, on the health of everything. Yeah. Inequality. Uh, inequality. Yeah. Is it important to the average person to be able to enact change? That's great, but you have long sentences. Powers. <laughs> 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 yeah. 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 Depressing, depressing, depressing. Right, um, let's move on. Let's imagine a society that has addressed all of these problems. Let's think of our utopia in which like, all of these problems that you have just listed have been sort sorted. Um, I want you to turn to your neighbour again or your little group, whoever you were working with, and that you could join a, a pair maybe down there. Um, I want you to think about three things that you think that it would value. Um, you can pick them off your list if you want, or you can pick another one. Uh, basically, a society that had addressed these problems is going to value three things in particular. And what would it not value? That's the harder question. What values do you think are harming the ability to get to those solutions? Does that make sense? Yeah? I'm going to give you another five minutes. Hmm. Yeah, I'm going to say, 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 I'm going
Give you one more minute. <laughs> Tell me something that it would value. Utopian society, what would it value? The environment. Yeah. Compassion. Uh, justice. Sorry, fairness and justice. Yeah. 
as, as, as success. <laughs> And they're not just a word cloud, and usually if we were in a better space, I would actually give you a poster of this and give you some stickers. I'm really sorry that I can't do that, because that is my favourite bit of the workshop. But here are the, uh, here are the values. Um, you've got some things up here that you said you valued. Um, you've got some things up here that you thought society might value, so things like justice um, and protecting the environment, for example, and like wealth and stuff down here. Um, these are data points, basically. So what Schwartz found, which was really, really interesting, was basically not just that there was a list of values that seemed to recur across the world, but that they had a dynamic relationship with each other. And that meant that um, there were some values that were likely to be held very strongly at the same time by the same person, and some <laughs> values which were not related to each other very strongly. So if somebody held one value really highly, they were likely to value another value really low, and they'd also li likely to value another value really highly. Um, by which I mean, uh, th so the dots that are closer to each other are more, uh, are more strongly related to each other. So they're more likely to be held strongly by the same person at the same time. Um, so what you get basically is things like wealth and authority and preserving our public image that are opposite things like equality, protecting the environment and inner harmony. Equality and protecting the environment and a world of beauty and unity of nature and things like that are all very closely related, which totally makes sense. There's an intuitive relationship there. So what Schwartz did after that basically was split split it down so it was a little bit uh, easier to digest. Um, and there's basically these 10 value groups that you put them into. Um, so most of the stuff that you said uh, was good for sorting stuff, really, it kind of falls within the kind of universal and benevolent stuff. Um, some of the other things that you said that you, val you valued yourself were in security, so things like health and things like that. Um, uh, yeah, so you kind of go around and there's this motivational um, continuum basically as you go around the circle. So these ones up here are about concern for other people, they're about concern for the group. Um, universalism is about the group being everybody. Benevolence is more about kind of group, uh, your close others. Um, conformity and tradition are about maintenance of the group, so maintenance of the status quo. And security, um, maintenance of the status quo and social order. Um, and a kind of in, a, in an anxiety-based kind of way. Um, you move through there into power, which is very much about social dominance, basically. It's about power over, um, not power to or power with. Um, and achievement, again, uh, about, yeah, again, conforming to social, condi uh, social standards um, of achievement and success, individual uh, achievement and success. Um, and then moving through into these values, which are more about openness to change. So you've got things like hedonism, stimulation, and self-direction, um, in which kind of things like freedom and creativity sit. Um, and so the interesting thing about it is that you can go anywhere around, the, around this map, and uh, the things that are on either side of it are very closely related. So universalism is very closely related to self-direction, and it's very closely related to benevolence. Um, and it has opposite values, it has opposing values as well. So power and achievement oppose universalism. That means that if you value universalism really highly, you're likely to value power much less. Um, and that, that relationship goes all the way around. Um, it, you can split it into a circle, um, and what you get is these self-transcendence values over here in, on one axis uh, versus the self-enhancement values. So that's um, concern for others but, or concern for one's own uh, self-enhancement and then you've got conservation values over there which are about like I said maintenance of the status quo and conservation of um, yeah the, uh, of, of, of a small social group versus openness to change which is much more about variety and change and creativity um, why does it matter well basically this exercise is kind of to 
show that they matter, I suppose, because there are those associations between values and outcomes in the way that you would think that there would be. Um, and what I mean by that is that if you value a particular thing really highly, there are a whole load of associated things that come with that. So the more you value universalism, for example, the more you do um, show concern for other people. Um, this set of icons, which are probably really hard to read on this strange perforated screen, are a set of things um, that are uh, associated with our values. So it's uh, all based on uh, sets of research, but basically um, we're, uh, yeah, it, it, how much we're concerned about global conflict, how much we're concerned about the environment, how much we recycle, how much we, um, we walk, how much we cycle, all those kinds of things are based on our values to a certain degree. Um, in summary, I guess values influence our relationships with each other. They um, influence how we view other people and how we respond to other people. Um, so the self-transcendence values are really associated with um, a view of other people as equals, basically. A view of other people as um, uh, connected um, and a view of people as part of a community, basically. Um, and uh, they're also associated with behaviours and attitudes that are related to that. So things like lower discrimination and lower sexism and lower racism and uh, lower prejudice to all other groups, um, higher support for immigration, etc, etc, etc. And the power and achievement values in particular are really related to a kind of hierarchical worldview in which you see some people as naturally better <coughs> than others. So a, a worldview in which you see there being these kind of natural hierarchies between people. Um, uh, so men are better than women, and white are better than black, and etc, etc, etc. Security and conformity values, so the conservation values, um, are also related with quite high levels of uh, prejudice as well, um, and uh, a lower concern for the natural world. Um, and the openness to change values, again, are quite related to um, yeah, concern for others, and concern for others' freedom and autonomy. Um, uh, yeah, they influence our relationships with the natural world. So again, the kind of um, dominatory worldview that um, is associated with the kind of power and achievement values um, is really related to that same sense of domination over the natural world. So seeing the natural world as a resource to be used um, for the benefit of humans, uh, and from that, exploitation, basically. Um, so yeah, power and achievement values are much less related to environmental behaviors and self-transcendence values are quite highly related to uh, environmental behaviours. Um, values also influence our own well-being. Um, so uh, things like power and security are actually related to lower levels of well-being, so lower le levels of, um, of, of comfort, so uh, higher levels of anxiety and higher levels of depression, for example. Um, and that's partially because they're, they're, they're naturally anxiety-based values. So like valuing power and, and achievement to a certain degree as well is kind of you're having to keep on top of the on top of the pile all the time. And so that's quite a um, yeah that's that's anxiety <coughs> creating basically. Um, universalism values are actually not associated with particularly high well-being either. They're actually associated with things like guilt and anxiousness about big problems, um, which also makes sense. Um, and they also influence the institutions and policies we create and support. So there's quite a few studies that show the relationship between uh, the aggregate level, uh, the aggregate scores on value surveys for <coughs> citizens of countries and the types of institutions and policies that they create. So um, uh, a few interesting ones um, in relation to things that you said. So uh, the higher that um, a country values things like power and achievement, um, the more appetizing to children that there is in a country, for example, the lower maternal uh, maternity leave or paternity leave there is in a country, um, and the higher uh, carbon footprint of that country. Um, so there's kind of lots and lots of things that values seem to influence. Um, the next interesting thing about values um, is that they are not just a kind of steady state thing that we hold or don't hold. They're actually um, kind of dynamic, and in the moment they can be engaged um, and uh, temporarily made more important to us. So things that we read or see or do, and um, the people that we interact with, the advertising that we see, or how we interact with, with institutions can engage um, our values temporarily. And that means that it will become temporarily more important to us. Um, so, uh, for example, if you read some text or do a word search which has a load of benevolence-related words in it, um, you're more likely to offer to help a researcher afterwards. 
Um, yeah. Values interact, so uh, that's also quite exciting. So if you engage a value, it also suppresses its opposites. So if you've had your benevolence values engaged by um, uh, doing this word search, you're less likely to, uh, to, to act in an achievement-related way or a power-related way afterwards, which means that you're less likely to be um, discriminatory afterwards, for example, or you're um, less likely to uh, not want to recycle. Yeah. <laughs> 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 they GPs as well. Yeah. <laughs> totally could. <laughs> um, and they also spill over into their neighbours. So if you've engaged universalism values, somebody is more likely to also respond in a way that is more self-directed and a way that's more benevolent. Um, yeah. So yeah, but you can kind of go any any of the ways around that. So basically, like. If you engage with your stimulation values, you're less likely to respond in a in a way uh, associated with conformity afterwards. And I mean, these these kind of relationships kind of make sense intuitively as well, but they have been shown uh, to actually work that way in experimental conditions, which aren't always great, you know. But they're, they're, they they seem to kind of this seems to recur. Um, so yeah. Um, how values are shaped. So obviously we, we aren't just born with our values, that isn't what happens. Um, our values are actually shaped by the societies around us. Um, I like this quote from Michael Sandel. Um, he's basically like arguing against the economic view of how we relate to each other. Um, uh, the current economic view, I shouldn't, yeah, brand all economics with the same brush. Um, but he says altruism, generosity, solidarity and civic spirit are not like commodities that are depleted with use. They're more like muscles that develop and grow stronger with exercise. And that's basically how values seem to work. So our values are reinforced by the society in which we live. They're reinforced by those experiences we have on a daily basis, um, and they grow stronger. Um, and so you can kind of see how the more we're swimming in this cultural, this neoliberal cultural soup, the more we're taking on those values. And that's what the research seems to suggest as well. Um, values grow depending on their conditions and opportunities. Um, basically, so when we have more opportunity to express particular values, we're more likely that they're, they're more likely to grow. Um, when there are like massive constraints to us expressing particular values, they're less likely to grow. Um, and that doesn't mean that they won't grow. Obviously, it's just that it's harder for us to have the chance to exercise and grow those muscles. Um, values. What? In the same way. All values react in the same way. Yeah. Or that's what the research would suggest. <laughs> um, our values basically are shaped by our lived experience. That's kind of, um, I think, the thing that gets a little bit terrifying when you start thinking about how an ideology starts seeping into like all of the different areas of our life, basically, because those values are likely to be engaged in all of these different areas of our life. Um, but uh, yeah, there's research around how our, how the type of family that we have and the, the type of home life that we have in our early life really shapes our values. And um, the education system in which we live really shapes our values. Um, yeah, a ton of things, which totally makes sense, you know, if you if you think about how we develop as human beings in general. Um, I'm going to give a few examples. One of my colleagues has a total vendetta against the national lottery, um, which. Uh, yeah, I kind of understand when he's explained it to me. But um, so this is just one example of how um, uh, something in our society can shape our values. Um, his argument, basically, and actually, there's some really shocking statistics. So uh, when the National Lottery was first launched in 1996 or whenever it was, um, it had higher uh, brand recognition than anything else that had ever been released in that way. Like it had something like 98% like recognition, as in like there had been such a huge advertising campaign behind it. It was the biggest advertising campaign. Uh, it, it was bigger than the uh, Coca-Cola's advertising campaign of that year, for example. It was like completely rolled out. There's something like I think it's 50 or 60 percent of the British population play the national lottery uh, on a weekly basis. Um, and anyway, there are tons of scary, scary statistics. But basically, I guess Rich's argument, my colleague, is that um, it's not just that people are playing this, it's the cultural message that we are being told through the National Lottery. So basically we're being told that success is money. We're being told that wealth is, uh, is what success looks like. It's, you could, it could be you, but it's not it could be you having this wonderful, happy life with people. It's, it could be you with lots and lots and lots of money. Money is the good thing here. Money is what you're being told. And it's not just that we're being told this on a, uh, a 
we're being told this on an incredibly regular basis, basically. So there's kind of something like 60,000 outlets in the UK for the National Lottery. There's branded stuff everywhere. There's advertising in, in newspapers everywhere. And basically, every time we see this, we're being reminded of that thing. We're being reminded that success is money and that we could be very, very rich. Um, so rich is basic argument, I guess, is that the National Lottery is an incredibly clever cultural institution, cultural institution that is spreading the values of power and achievement. Um, uh, I'd like to argue that the media is um, uh, a massive propagator of, of our cultural values. Um, I saw this when I was on holiday and I just thought it was amazing. <laughs> I have no idea how the Hitler gerbil flooded the village, but anyway. Um, the media tells us on a daily basis that we should be scared of people, that people are worse than us, that people are bad, um, that we should be scared of whoever it is, um, or that we should read about such and such celebrity. Um, I like to look on Facebook every day for what's trending, and it's never anything important. It's like never ever anything important, and it terrifies me that like that, that our values are being shaped in this way on a daily basis. And I do think there's some exciting stuff in, in like you know alternative media and stuff, but. Um, even just going into a shop, you're kind of you've got this spread of stuff in front of you, which is telling you to think a particular thing every day, and it's telling you that a particular thing is important, and it's telling you that a particular value system is important. Um, I don't know what values are in this, but he flooded a village. What's he doing? <laughs> um, I think the NHS is a really, really important one, like massively important. Um, I think that the um, the, the, the bringing in of the welfare state was an incredibly important part of shaping British values. Um, I think that it was really important that there was a whole load of stuff in there about uh, the commonality of experience uh, of, of, of all of these institutions and that you know no one left behind and all those kinds of things and us all as um, connected citizens and um, yeah, I mean, yeah, the NHS is massively important basically. I, I probably don't need to tell any of you that. Um, but. Um, it's basically we know that these poli that the, the, the politics that uh, that we create as a society and the institutions that politicians create and the policies that are put into place um, are shaping us. And by which I mean they're shaping our values, and through shaping our values, they're creating a culture which is then producing all of these different outputs. So um, it's not like uh, the thing about it that's important is that it's it's really connected. Um, just got this quote from Margaret Thatcher just because she's really, she was obviously incredibly clued up on exactly that. She, she knew that what she was doing was trying to shape culture. She wasn't just uh, trying to find technocratic solutions to something or like put in some uh, economic policies. She was trying to change the heart and soul of the nation, as she says. Um, I pulled out this quote a while ago from a from an education white paper in 2010 from the foreword from David Cameron and Nick Clegg. I just think, I guess, it's quite a nice example of how these uh, institutions are shaped in this kind of cultural way. Um, so much of the education debate in this country is backward looking, but what really matters is how we're doing compared with our international competitors. That's what will define our economic growth and our country's future. Um, I think that's amazing, because when you think about that, and when you think about how that shapes our education policy, and how that shapes the experience that a child has of ed education, if what we're focusing on is uh, how we're doing compared with our international competitors or um, what will define our economic growth, then it, it shapes a very different <coughs> education system from one which perhaps said what really matters is how, our, how fulfilled and connected our children feel, for example. Um, no one did say that, though. Um, which leads us on to frames, basically, because frames are, are how, um, how meaning is kind of shaped around uh, things. Um, um, primarily through values, but kind of through lots of other little little things as well, I suppose. Um, <coughs> frames, uh, I basically like to think of them as like what's left in and what's left out. Um, I'll explain that through an example, hopefully. Um, you might not be able to read that, it says school. <laughs> um, if I said the word school to you, what do you think of? Uniforms. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Spice Girls. Spice pudding. Alright. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> Spice pudding. Yeah, it's semolina I had her in that. 
Um, so there's loads of things that you probably think about, and we've kind of got a shared understanding of what the word school means, I guess. Like, we've got a whole load of things that we all share in our understanding, and it's not to say that there aren't things that will be different. So you might think of the Spice Girls, and somebody else might think of the Bee Gees, and somebody else, whatever, you know. There's a whole load of things which are, which are different, but basically we have this kind of shared set of uh, meaning around um, just one particular word. Um, and I guess the point is that there's kind of all these values which are also connected to those things. So there's things, um, and I think there's like a debate around uniforms. Like this was my one of my colleagues, Ralph, who draws cartoons, who did this. But um, he's put that they're all about conformity. But I think there's something important in there just about the commonality of wearing the same thing. There's something about there in, in terms of equality, isn't there? But basically each of these different elements of our of our experience of the of the frame of school has something to do with values as well and so like um the discipline that was involved for example or uh, whatever else it is so there's something shared that we understand when we think about school i just have to say the word school to you and you think something about the school and it probably doesn't involve this <laughs> basically there's things that are left out of the word school as well so if i say my job is like school you don't think of a unicorn you don't think what's a unicorn doing at your work you might think, why have you got uniforms, for example, but um, yeah. So framing is kind of this kind of personal architecture of meaning through which we understand and communicate the world. Um, and it's reinforced through repeated engagement. Um, so like the reason we all have this shared understanding of the word school is because like we have repeatedly either been to school, watched Grange Hill, uh, read education policy, you know, whatever it is, like we've got a shared understanding of the word school because of that. Um, framing then is language choice. So, like I said, if I said the word, if I said my job is like being at school, you think of a certain set of things. If I say my job is like uh, being on holiday, you probably think of another set of things. Um, and it, it kind of suggests different uh, problems and different solutions, perhaps. Um, framing is also story. It's the kind of narrative that we tell around particular things. Um, it can be metaphor. It can be things like uh, the nanny state, for example. Like there's something, there's a, there's a metaphor in there that, that, that creates a set of meaning around how we understand our relationship to government. Um, and it's also situation and context. So um, our understanding of the word school also comes from our actual experience of um, school. Um, Framing matters, I guess, because it shapes meaning in the moment. Um, so here's a study that I, I think is really important and I think kind of in some ways got me to thinking about um, what was going on in the NHS, I suppose. Um, so uh, in this study, people did a computer task in which, it w which was either called the consumer reaction task or the citizen reaction task. Um, and the people um, who had done the consumer reaction task were far more attracted to materialistic words afterwards. And um, when they did a, uh, a um, water management task afterwards, they were more competitive and they uh, conserved less water. They felt more anxious, um, they felt more depressed, um, they were less likely to volunteer to do any kind of civic activity afterwards, um, a whole load of other things, basically. Um, and like when you think about that, when you think about like how much we are being talked about as consumers, it, it basically hit me because of the way we are becoming consumers of the NHS, and that that made me go, oh God, there's a whole load of things that are being undermined through through that framing. Um, so another example, um, people. So well, there's two studies here which I've mashed into one, but people were either asked to check their tire pressure. In in one study, they were asked to check their tire pressure. In another, they were asked to join a car share scheme, um, and in one uh, in one uh, 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 group, they were um, they were asked to do it because it would save them money. So um, check your tire pressure because you'll save money, um, or join a car share scheme; it will save you money. Um, in the other ones, they were so in one it was um, join a car share scheme so you can get to know other people and be part of the community. Um, and or, or check your tyre pressure because it's good for the environment. And basically the money framing resulted in no tyre pressure checks in this, in this experiment. Um, it decreased the likelihood of joining a car share scheme. Um, and what the researchers sneakily did afterwards was they asked people to draw a logo of the car share scheme. Um, and then they asked them to throw the ones they didn't want away in the bin. And they had one recycling bin and one non-recycling bin there because researchers mm -hmm. like that. People were less likely to recycle when they'd uh, read the money framing one. Um, and the point about that experiment, I guess, which is important, is that 
Um, the way that things are framed has a knock-on effect on other things. It's not just that it has that impact there, it has an impact on the way that we think about lots of other things. Um, whereas the environment or community framing, because it's tapping into those universalism values, um, which are associated with environmental and social concern, um, led to higher incidence of tyre pressure check, obviously, and uh, increased recycling rates. Um, uh, and yeah, similar things have been found in healthcare. Basically, financial incentives, um, or the motivation for a financial incentive, seems to undermine um, people's uh, uh, behaviours, choices, and uh, these things like fruit and vegetable intake. Um, yeah, I mean, leading on from that, I think what's important is that framing creates common sense in the longer term as well. It's not just that it um, has that um, initial impact, but the more that we think about ourselves as consumers, for example, the more we start to respond in a consumer way in all of these different contexts. Um, so uh, the meaning of road, right? So I think when I get to a road, um, there might be some cars, um, there might be some bicycles, it's going to lead me somewhere. You know, there's a whole set of meanings around around that, um, and they're built up from my experience. And the point is that, like, I get, um, I get, uh, I know what how I should respond to that road. Um, I should stop telling this story because it's a bit mean. But my friend Alice still doesn't look when she crosses the road. She turned 30 this year, and the reason is she grew up in a really small rural village, and road does not mean cars to her, right? So basically, I guess <laughs> the point is that, like. Um, the repeated framing is creating your common sense of what a thing is. Um, and like I said, I think this is important because uh, going back to the consumer citizen study, and this is just one graph and there's a few others that we've got in, a, in another report that we did, um, which basically shows that the instance of the term uh, consumer is on the rise, and that's just a kind of proxy for thinking about how we're thought of in society, I guess. Um, and as I said, I, I guess the thing that I think is important is that the framing uh, of whatever that thing is then spills out into all of these different things. Um, I think Thomas was saying earlier how, for example, social change is now seen as a commodity in lots of lots of respects. And I think that that's, um, again, a really important thing about how, that, how the framing of whatever the thing is becomes our common sense. Um, so if I start to think of myself as a consumer in one thing, uh, it, firstly, it's just applied to the retail context, but the more it starts to be applied to all of these other contexts, the more I'm likely to apply that to any more contexts that I've come across. Um, and it matters because it shapes cultural common sense, so it's the political bit of this, I guess. So, like, the more everybody thinks of themselves as consumers, the more of a consumer society we have altogether. Um, so, framing is both personal, it's the architecture of meaning through which we understand and communicate the world, um, and it's political, basically. It becomes our cultural common sense. Um, so within framing, um, I guess, there's kind of these different elements. Um, so there's kind of who, who, who's in the frame, like what the characters are. Is it a consumer? Is it a citizen? Is it a parent? Is it a doctor? Is it whatever else? Um, and what, yeah, what roles do these people play and what, what meaning is, is, is held within each of those different characters. Um, how people relate to each other, so what relationships exist um, uh, and who has power within those relationships as well, which is really important. Um, so I mean, uh, in a school frame, for example, like just uh, as I said before, even just the word school, you've got all these different ideas that come out of that. There's some roles in that, in that frame, there's some roles in the frame of school. Um, which are like pupils and teachers and blah 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 blah, um, and within that you've got some relationship between like teachers and pupils, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, uh, and you've also got um, a, an idea probably of what matters within that school frame, and it's possible that that changes over time. So it might be uh, what matters when you think of the word school is learning, um, or it might be achievement, uh, or it might be discipline. There's a whole load of different things that um, that can be important. And I think the important thing about it, I guess, um, is that there are these big level cultural frames um, about who we are or how we relate. Um, and in the who we are one, um, for a long time we've been thought about as homo economicus, right? So it's embedded in all these economic systems that we are this kind of rational, self-serving, maximizing profit um, individual. Um, and 
it's a frame which is very much connected to those power and achievement values, basically. Um, this is supposed to be Adam Smith, by the way. Um, uh, I, I propose that the alternative, I guess, is a, a, a much more complex being, which is, sorry, <laughs> uh, we're not all Homer Simpson, but uh, somebody who is uh, much more driven, or uh, an understanding that humans are much more driven by their emotions and values and things like that as well. Um, and I guess there's a few important things from that in, in terms of like how we campaign for things or how we uh, create institutions um, or policies for a Homer Simpson rather than a, a, a Homer, Homer Economicus. Um, I kind of pull these out. Like, I, I, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of more throwing them back at you, but um, it's not enough just to pre present the facts. Um, I was just talking about uh, the book NHS SOS before, and I think it was really, really wonderful. And there were a few really, really important lessons that came out of it, I think. And one of them, I think, was that um, it's not like information isn't sufficient, basically. Like, the, there's, um, particularly within the scientific communities, I think, there's a real, um, there's this kind of feeling that, um, but we've got the evidence, we know we're right, and therefore people are, people are going to take us at our word. Um, and, and, you know, the facts will win out, what's true will win out. Um, and it just doesn't seem to be the case, I guess. Like it, it seems to be focusing us on a, a Homo economicus model of, of, of human nature, basically. Um, and and then secondly, I guess more specifically, like how we challenge the choice frame. How do we challenge the choice framework within, um, which is being brought out into well, it's yeah, rife in um, healthcare, I guess. Um, because again, that is very much based on the idea of a of a very rational being who can make choices based on full information, etc. Um, in the Scottish independence referendum, there was an organisation called Commonweal. Um, I've stolen their, their, their phrasing, basically. Um, they said that we're living in a time of me-first politics. Again, this is kind of a big cultural level frame, which is, um, to some degree, common sense. So we think of these these hierarchies in lots of things that we do. It's, it's me first. It's how can I get to the top of the pile? Um, and we think about particular sets of people as being more important than other sets of people. So we live in a very like power-driven society, um, basically. Um, and that's not necessarily to say that we all believe that. It's just that it's a really like common frame that's used. And I think that it's a common frame that is used even by people who don't necessarily buy into that. Um, and common, we all suggested that we go for uh, an all of us first politics instead. So how can we create institutions and policies that are for um, everyone, um, but also that emphasize the common good um, over the individual good? Um, and again, um, how, uh, this, this is a really basic question, but how can we campaign for universality? I mean, we're losing it, like it's, it's gone. I mean, it's not, it's not there, it's not, in, it's not even in the legal framework of, of the NHS anymore. Um, and, yeah, it's, it's depressing. <laughs> um, success equals money. I think that's another really, really strong cultural frame. Um, and I think it's one that um, a lot of progressive organisations or a lot of um, social and environmental organisations end up falling into the trap of as well. So um, there have been lots of organisations who have argued for whatever their cause is on the basis that it will be good for economic growth. Um, and um, sadly, I mean, the research seems to suggest that because it engages those power and achievement values, it's actually likely to undermine success of, um, or it's un likely to undermine people's motivation for um, uh, for caring about people. So they might go for it just because they will get money in the in the short term, um, but they're unlikely to uh, for, for that to spill out onto any other behaviours or attitudes. Um, so yeah, arguing for a kind of success as something else. Um, framework would be good, um, which again was something that you already highlighted earlier. Um, so again, how do we uh, how do we make the case for healthcare with, with for more reasons than the economic? Um, and I guess the reason I'm saying this, and I mean it seems really obvious to people, I think, but I've heard increasing numbers of arguments for doing things on a health basis because it's ec like economically worth it. So uh, uh, I was reading about something recently. F uh, trying to, um, people were arguing for uh, earlier intervention into domestic violence cases um, because it would save the healthcare money in the long run. And like, I don't think we should have to make those arguments. Like, we should be able to say, let's like, help uh, women who are, who are experiencing violence 
um, for reasons that are more than economic. Um, yeah. There are big issues in that if we, we intervene for women, not for children, we intervene for children in terms of helping problems, start with women accumulate through childhood, then you actually, um, you, there's, a, there's an enormous economic imperative to do that. We can't get that message across. Um, it will affect the number of people who. Well, that's the other thing. You never do try to say that way. You, you, you bring up the choice issue. It's um, one of the things as uh, uh, the, uh, you know, the fetus who is a small child has no choice. Yeah. Um, and this idea that uh, we can determine our destiny by you know, the way we behave is pure nonsense in the back of us. Yeah. Yeah. Another example is the recent thing of how they're losing billions because of maternal mental health and, which, and, and the consequences on the children. But you know, I've been for decades fighting for more resources for perinatal mental health. Mm -hmm. And we've known for a long time the damage of those two, particularly boys. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of like all that human suffering, but it's got to be put into a figure mm -hmm. before people start paying attention. Do you see what I mean? And yeah. as you say, it kind of undermines it because it might think, oh, we've got this certain amount of money, maybe we can just dispense with that. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Well, yeah, you get into a position if it's just uh, been diluted down to a number in which you can yeah. just substitute. Um, you yeah. can say, well, actually, this yeah, is more worth it then. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I guess the, the the reason I think it's important, um, and it's <coughs> ob obviously entirely debatable, but um, uh, I think that we can't create change with the same story that created the problem, basically. So. Um, I suppose the argument that you can make once you've kind of spanned up from values up to this cultural level is that there's a culture of uh, promoting a particular set of values that is being promoted through a whole set of institutions and policies and basically a, a dominant ideology that has been, um, that has infiltrated all of these different institutions. Um, and that those, that that culture is based on a set of values um, around power and achievement and a set of frames which is around um, money and uh, hierarchy um, and uh, some kind of very narrow form of rationality um, and that trying to um, trying to change that system using those same those, those same ideas and those same principles is actually just going to keep undermining it um, and I think that basically that the, the this is just one way of thinking about it, but the social psychology research kind of seems to back that up as a as an idea. And I suppose another illustration would be the um, the Labour Party conference was when that this old chap came and spoke on the stage you know, see it on the internet mm -hmm. about you know why it's so important that we should go back to a university provided with public provided health service, mm -hmm. and he told the story of how he grew up having no access to health care just was so detrimental to his family and the people around him and mm -hmm. he was very emotional about it and mm -hmm. people were crying in the audience so you can approach um, mm -hmm. people not through rationality but through emotion as well. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. Yeah. and actually yeah. I'd, and I'd yeah. argue that it's what it's what, what people uh, are motivated by. Yeah. It's not actually that people are motivated by knowing how much. Yeah. <laughs> yes, but I mean that all the time, but there's a particular, there's a particular problem with the way we perceive children, so I always think about children. There is an issue, we don't see them as we don't see them as the responsibility of their parents. And when their parents fail, then we've got child protection, and you know, we yeah. have you know, punitive things, and we take their children away, and so on. And not that I'm saying that it's necessary in many cases, but, um, we, uh, we don't see them as being our future society. Um, and the only people who are going to, there was talk of social unrest, uh, you know, they carry 
I mean, I would argue that making the economic case for that, it just it, it isn't sufficient, I suppose, because like no. it's not just that we need to be able to give our children um, enough resources to be able to. Well, it's not that we just need to give them financial resources. We need to give them the cultural resources as well. And I guess that the point is that like if we can try and create a culture in which um, there are an, a different set of values that are being valued, then the children are more likely to be able to come up with the solutions yes. for how to deal with. A much more uncertain world, which is what they're going to be thrown into. Like we we are heading for a, a warming world and uh, and a more financially insecure world, and a world in which probably global conflicts are going to increase rather than decrease, given all the other stresses. But if the current sort of values are more about you know the the to, when you, you bring up cases, you know, like the story of this morning about the child suffering from fuel poverty, um, you're, you're going to get, well, why does not case they just do something like that? Right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and there is a lot of uh, notion that that's, that's just got bad parents, you know? Yeah. But I think that's why we probably need a narrative that isn't just around... Um, so there's a notion of citizenship, and I don't know the whole thing about it, but the notion of citizenship about being not just about individual responsibility, but the state's responsibility to you, so the, the rights that you hold as a citizen. And it seems to me as if what's the narrative that we're being told is exactly what you've just said. It's that you have um, uh, individual responsibility, but the rights have been taken away, basically. The, right, the, the rights bit of that narrative seems to have been eroded. Um, sorry, you go... You had In terms of re relation this, NHS. I think in the last few years there's been this massive thing that we, the only thing of value that we're constantly reminded about the NHS is that we value as a brand. And if you think about it in terms of like public health provision and this TTIP agreement, whatever, you know, it makes no sense that public health would not be protected under an agreement like that, other than we're, we're told that the NHS is a valuable export and it's gone so far away from what what it ever meant and, and what it is as an institution and the more we're reminded about you know, the value of that those blue letters, the value of the energy the brands globally, the less people will buy for it and the less people will realise what it means to them and how lucky we are. Yeah. And also I'd argue the less we even think about so ourselves as citizens in that way that is yeah. that connected way of not just responsibilities but rights as well. I agree. Yeah. I'm just going to ask what research there is to show how easy it is to actually change people's values because they are so entrenched. They are, yeah. And you have two say, political parties who are coming from such, um, with such different values. Mm. They must have to have some compromise in the middle to understand each other because I, I don't know how easy it is for one side to change mm. the other one's values. You know, and that, that in turn is 
Yeah, I totally agree. I, I, I think that it's really, like, it's, it's very difficult to change en masse a whole load of people's values. That's a really difficult thing to do. Um, the positive bit of the story is that um, if you look at people's values, and this has been kind of corroborated by stuff other than self-report, um, people actually seem to value, like, universalism and, and benevolence over uh, over power and achievement. It's just that we're kind of seeped in a society which is asking us to behave in another way. So it's asking us all the time to value something else than we actually do. And we're quite, um, we're quite susceptible to our environments, basically. So we tend to seem to respond to our environments in the way that our environment is asking us to respond. So we're constantly told to respond to something in a way that is valuing success and money and all these other things. And so we're kind of like, you know, if you ask most Daily Mail readers, I'm really sorry if any of you are Daily Mail readers, if you ask most Daily Mail readers like what they think of the Daily Mail, they're like, it's crap, you know? They really do, but, you know, they keep reading it. And it's the same with most things. I don't know if, you know, I mean, most of you are probably aware we've got the, like, kind of better than average effect. But, like, everyone thinks that they're better than everyone else, basically. 95% of people think that they're better drivers than everybody else, and, like, they're, they're a better than average driver. 95% of people think they're more ethical than other people. And the reason for that, I th the, the only reason for that that I can see, really, is that like the way that we get to see what other people are like is in all these different situations in which we've been told to behave in a way that isn't actually accordant with our nature, I think. Um, so there's there's two sides to that kind of human nature thing that came up a bit earlier. Like we are naturally competitive and to some degree self-interested, but we're also naturally cooperative and all these other things as well. And so think we're kind of in a society which is drawing this side out of us because of those cultural narratives I was just talking about. But there's a whole other set of cultural narratives that we could be telling. I think going back to the NHS, the government has been really successful in that and their whole in the white paper before the House Constitution Act a two values which is very efficient and effectiveness. Mm -hmm. And they've effectively communicated that to the larger population. Yeah. Because we value efficiency and effectiveness, we need to do NHS. Yeah. Whereas if you basically reclaiming those yes. things that it was about and, and speaking very loudly like, well, we were already doing it and you're screwing it up, basically. I think we need more collaboration between, like, our unions and, you know, our employees, so I've got, you know, it's a really good thing to say a lot on that, It's really difficult though because I mean there's been like really clever legislation put in place to like get rid of solidarity for example so I mean even union striking you're not allowed to strike in solidarity with another union so it makes it quite difficult. Well, great to have a story around that. Yeah, I, I completely agree. Um, yeah, very much so. There was an amazing quote, and I think it was from Grant Shapps a few years ago, and I don't think it was about healthcare, but he said, we're not trying to get rid of privilege, we're trying to spread privilege around. But like, again, it's another one of those concepts where it, it, you <laughs> that's not a thing. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll wrap up really quickly, because I mean, my basic, what I wanted to do anyway was to leave my 
that set it into discussion anyway. So, um, yeah, I'll, I'll wrap up and then we can go back to the exercise. But I guess the key lessons from the, the values and frames stuff that we work on is that homo economicus isn't really a thing. Like, it's, it's silly to, to keep focusing our efforts on this kind of rational, self-interested individual. Um, and also, in the same respect, keep just trying to feed the, the right information to the right people because that isn't how people make decisions. People make decisions based on like emotions and stories and how connected they feel to the person who's speaking about the thing and a whole load of other things. Um, nothing's values neutral, and I think again, this is another really like sly thing that the um, that the the way everything has been framed as economics uh, as uh, as an economic argument. Um, and in doing so also neutral, like economics has really cleverly framed itself as the neutral discipline. So like making a, a quantifiable number for something is the way that you, you are, you, you portray something objectively, but it's not. There's, there's, there's so many values inherent within, within all of those models. So like a cost benefit analysis, for example, values different people's time and lives differently. And um, we all know that, you know, a, a wealthier person or a person from a wealthier country is valued more highly in a cost-benefit analysis than a poorer person. Um, and so basically, like, recognising that the, that the communications that we're making or the way that we're shaping these institutions and policies are never going to be values neutral. They're going to be promoting a particular set of, of values. Um, and those values that are being promoted within whatever that thing is shape our responses to global issues. So. Um, they shape how concerned we are about other people and they shape how concerned we are about the environment. Um, they shape uh, our, uh, our attitudes towards um, giving health care to other people, etc, etc. Um, each of those issues um, that, like, for example, you threw up are really, really connected. And it's obvious for so many different reasons, but one of the reasons is the values that lie behind them as well. So there are a whole set of values that are really common um, to what causes the problem and also um, on the other side of the problem. Um, so, like, I mean, again, all of the speakers were saying this in a really nice way earlier as well, but there's um, a lot of connections between um, lots of different issues. Um, and lastly, I guess, society shapes our values. Um, the societies that we live in shape our values. Um, and as, as I said before, there are interesting differences between countries. You can see um, national differences. Um, and they do seem to be based on those, the, you know, the different experiences of their citizens. And world attitudes are a little bit more interesting. Yeah. More conservative values, generally, you know, pro marriage, anti divorce, and so on. You know, yeah. Individual countries, you know, UK, Netherlands, so there's no a national level in our crime and decision. Yeah. Yeah, and there's a World Values Survey as well, and a, and a European one that I was talking about before. Um, so, how do we shape that society to make, um, to promote the values that underpin the kind of solutions? Um, I've just kind of written a few things down here, um, and uh, I was tapping away while speakers were going on, so I included Medico in there just because I'm talking about the way that they worked, I just found fascinating. It's so important to think about the, the actual ways that we're, that, that we're working. It's um, uh, uh, really nice. Uh, I think, you know, uh, I was just talking to you about this before as well, but the workplaces in which we are, the institutions in which we are, are also engaging particular values um, in us on a daily basis. And um, in doing so, like we are all part of society as well, and, and our responses are being shaped by those institutions in which we work. So if we work in an organisation that does things like participatory budgeting and things like that, then we're much more likely to be having our kind of community-focused values engaged, and we're much more likely to uh, be uh, motivated to find community-oriented solutions to those problems. Um, yeah, and things like working together again, like lots of people were talking about those, talking about that as well. Um, it, the reason, like, I, like, well, I mean, yeah, I'm interested in the NHS because I'm a citizen of this country and I bloody love the NHS and I'm very sad about its um, slow demise. Um, but I also was talking to a researcher that we work with who's a linguist, actually, um, and he's got two family members with quite severe mental health um, issues. Um, and he was just horrified by everything that was going on and he was like, please, can we do something about this, basically? And, like, uh, he kept just pulling up all of these different bits of literature from places. And there were things like... Um, uh, a, a job advert for a, for a, a mental health nurse, um, 
And in there, if you read the language, it's so managerial, you've totally forgotten by the end of it that you're talking about care for people. Um, you're t you've totally forgotten that. Um, there was a really nice TED talk a while ago about um, what, what jobs actually entail and how we don't actually um, base things on that or how we don't um, try and encourage that or allow that to happen. I was talking about um, a hospital janitor um, and you know the, the, the uh, job description again just says you know clean blah whatever you know very technical things um, and they went and spoke to a hospital janitor about what she does and he was like well I go around and I talk to people and I look after people and I check that everyone's all right and I make sure that the nurses are talking to each other and all this kind of thing and yet we don't um, create the, the the conditions for those things to actually be encouraged and obviously they happen anyway you know good flows out anyway and that's nice but um, I guess basically the argument is that we should be creating those systems from the small all the way up to the big for people to be responding in the ways that are actually in our nature. <coughs> a nice bit. Uh, I can't remember. Um, I can dig it out. Email me. Um, uh, yeah, so how else? Telling a powerful story. I mean, that's kind of, yeah, the narrative basically. How are we telling a narrative about? the NHS or about healthcare, about who we are as citizens or about tax or whatever else it is, um, the story should be a powerful one. Um, another really interesting thing that I thought came out of the NHS SOS book was that um, there wasn't enough connection with the grassroots, and by the grassroots I mean just like the doctors and the nurses and whoever else, like the, the BMA's slow response to things was partly because it seemed as if the, the top levels, the higher levels, weren't speaking to the bottom levels enough, or like there were, there were lots of people basically who were concerned about things and there just didn't seem to be enough connection between all of these different uh, layers. Um, and participation of institutions and with wider membership bases um, is quite important. Uh, campaigning for big societal changes is the thing I've just thrown in there at the end. So um, the earlier speakers, um, the first couple, uh, uh, anyway, there were lots of really interesting kind of technical solutions to things proposed, um, but I think that um, I'd like to propose that values kind of underpin some of those things as the kind of cultural element of that, like what glues everything together basically, what makes that coherent story about us as a, as a nation or as a, as a, a, a global society. Um, creating a new common sense basically, so from a kind of hierarchical me first success is money kind of one to a uh, one in which collective well-being is the thing that's really important. That's it. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, so we can go back to what the last exercise was, or we can just have a bit of a discussion if you want. But I mean, basically, I was going to suggest that we had a little discussion around some of those things that had either been proposed earlier or some ideas that you had for yourself. For yourself, for example, like bringing human rights to the fore again. Um, and thinking about how you frame it, and by that I didn't just mean the language. I guess I was kind of talking about what that would, how it would, um, yeah, how it would, what, what it would look in like in practice, like what kind of institution it would look like. So um, we've got about twenty minutes. Like, does anyone have any questions or anything, or does anyone want to have a chat, or do people want to break into small groups or head to another session? I don't mind. <laughs> any questions? Cool. How do you think um, a lot of the public discourse around the NHS is going to impact upon the opinions of NHS workers themselves? Because one of my observations this year is that there's been incredible success in presenting the NHS as a failure, which allows people to legitimise their own poor work and lack of responsibility. And for example, the consultant not taking any responsibility to ensure there's a care package in place for an elderly patient or not taking responsibility to ensure that they have their imaging thing on time so they don't have to stay for another four days or whatever. And I've heard it again and again this year that they will just say this system we work in is crap and the NHS is so inefficient. And I feel like bit by bit by bit a lot of people who work in the NHS have also been kind of gripped by this talk around it on a political level. Mm -hmm. and I think that's really worrying. Mm. It's really interesting. Does anyone have any thoughts? Yeah. I think the doctors are so uh, detached from patients now because there are so many doctors involved. No one has any role of responsibility for that patient. There's just so much about them. There's a queue of other people who also take responsibility for different bits of the patient. Is that, I mean, is that, is it's not a personal thing between you and a doctor. 
motivation for so many other people as well. They've all got bits of motivation as well. So you don't feel valued, you don't enjoy the value of helping them because everyone else has helped as well. And you don't feel the same sense of responsibility. Maybe. Mm -hmm. Can't be the private health service going to be more efficient and more caring. I, I, that's not what I meant more at all. Yeah. I kind of meant that the more you talk about the NHS as this inefficient beast yeah, on yeah. a political level, the more people perceive it as being that. Well, mm. yeah. And yeah. and that's not because it is, but yeah. it's because it legitimizes. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy. Yeah. It legitimizes poor practice on an individual basis because supposedly you're working in this service which is broken. Well, basically, they're taking money out of the health service, aren't they, to make it less efficient and less efficient. And then they'll say it's failing, and then they have their arguments, and it's even further. Mm -hmm. That's 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 the strategy. Yes. Mm -hmm. I guess a lot of the lot of the value for being transferred, like the tools you have, you know, there's no one side of the segment, and you have value for everyone. You have to start with everyone. Um, and I see the call for after you know, about to um, have it set for education and to be new value. I think it's been really cleverly framed as a consumerist uh, object rather than anything else. I mean, things like the friends and family test or whatever it's called, you know, where you, you know, say whether you recommend it and stuff like that. I mean, that's like what you do to a consumer good. That's not what you do to a healthcare service that we all share. But yeah. I, I don't think you're right. I mean, I, I, I think you're, what you're saying is a factor in it. The healthcare workers, no longer have relationships with the patients. They're not working with them. They're responsible to that relationship. The values of this are looking after them. It doesn't look critically at them in the same way because they have a friendly sort of relationship. They don't harm to enough of those because there isn't time. And look at every patient as well. That place here we can make more. And so the patient, the patient just has 50 or well, 10 people looking after them. They just don't feel value. No one's particularly friendly to them and they don't feel they're getting the value from them. So I think the reason it's about is that um, I, I have this perception that they're changing to sort of the process
sorts of systems to try and prevent something falling through. And actually, you stop people from thinking. You, 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 you have, you know, that um, all sorts of organizations have failed to recognize an enormous risk of child protection, which mm -hmm. just fall through the hole because everybody's so busy, you know, trying to have this, this, this net, this service, and without actually looking at um, the reality of what's going on for this particular individual. Mm -hmm. I mean, the point is that unless you care, there's so much evidence, unless you care for well-being of those working in an organization, you will not get to the compassionate activist in the way for the traditional yeah, right. uh, behavior. It's not down to it. I think particularly um, for nurses, there's a huge problem of bullying within oh the yeah, NHS. Oh, yeah, there's all sorts of things. I mean, all sorts of toxic things. And but actually, managerialism is yeah. one of them. Yes, well, the, well, they have to respond differentially to the to the um, defensive paperwork and many Yeah, but they're not alone. GPs also say, I mean, yesterday I was running a resilience workshop, which I was going to do a resistance workshop, but I mean, the collective pain of these people, that yeah. they want to do a good job. The only thing that gave them really meaning and purpose in their work was make was being able to make a difference to somebody with a relational life. Right. They are all the time there are all these other things that will attend to, you know, these ridiculous performance management measures and so on. And lack of time and a bullying culture, you know, it's not so much necessarily the practice, but coming from the book, you know, on high. Through uh, the managers. The CQC, yeah. the, um, you know, where our appraisal process now is unbelievable. And, and it's causing suffering. I mean, there are those, there are the patient sites that don't really want to do it.
rights, we write letters for housing grants, we, you know, we, we do what we can, and yeah. I think people are often they're working humans. late and really sorting things out, and people really value that, but I think we're also fighting against kind of system outside. I, I spent yeah. half an hour on the phone to a Department of Work and Pensions for a patient who is a cancer patient, also a carer, also recently bereaved, also with multiple health problems of, apart from cancer. And I'm getting stressed, and I'm the healthcare professional trying to get through to some Kafka-esque nightmare yeah. of some centre in Newport in South Wales, which says they're in page 17. I'm holding the <laughs> so maybe these were, but you know, we, so yeah. I think that there's lots of, so some of the media stuff, whereas for some people it might create despondency, maybe I'm kind of, you know, for me it makes me feel angry and want to do a better yeah. job. Yeah. And there are some people speaking out, there's somebody's blog, um, some blogger called, he's a finance person, I think at Chelsea and Westminster, so I don't know about now much to say, he's a northern chap, but some of his blogs are about football, so I, I delete those, and the others are about, you know, the financial aspect I'm trying to sort of explain to people what's going on financially. So maybe there are small ways in which we can all make, you know, put forward what we are doing, what our services are doing, what we value. Right. But but yes, the amount of stress, I mean, the health professionals and nurses, uh, recent health the yeah. executive, mm -hmm. highest stress levels in healthcare professionals, particularly nurses, and all the, yeah. So it's mm -hmm. like, how do we look after ourselves as well so that we don't go on? I'm not frightened to stand on the street in my own community and hand out leaflets and talk to people 
and say, you know, this is happening. It's your health yeah. service. It's on the way to be totally privatised now. Yeah. Is that what you want? Yeah. And um, people do want to learn. Better. Yeah, I think it'd be really powerful as well because yeah. people trust healthcare workers. Yeah. It's not like people don't trust the healthcare service already, and people love the healthcare service, and people don't want it to be privatised either. Like they really don't. like local workers doing that kind of outreach stuff is really really important because you do have that local trust like people do trust their own GP even if they think the ones in wherever might be Harold Chipman yeah. Yeah. Hyde's a really funny place though yeah. I used to work in Hyde <laughs> do say that, don't they? They say don't vote for somebody if there's somebody else in the area who's going to do what we'd like to do. Anyway, go. Sorry. Sounds like it all trickles down, and then you go, oh, not sure about this. Well, like, no, is I mean, there a way it, of like it trickles <laughs> down, hits, and then you know breaks into small pieces across, and yeah. it's easier to it resolve. It's easier to win.
so that led to the making of the internet connections here between the Yeah, I guess that's why like something like movement building is something that's really important, like seeing it as a kind of movement that you're building rather than just a campaign that you're working on, I think is really important. Because something like that that you just said is like it's about building that momentum and it's about building a community of people who then feel like they're A, connected and they know who to go to when they want to talk about something, and also B, that they can go forward and do something together in the future as well. That's a question. We've talked about what's the problem with this. Yeah. But are we not saying it's got more money spent? Because we won't get what we want without more money. It's not, there's people cutting down on money, you know, gaining the rent and less nurses and so on. We're going to have to have more money to be able to do what we want to do and spend the time on the patients and so on. Are we facing up to that as well? Mm -hmm. Where's the money going to come from? Is the government going to give it to us? Well, it's We should possibly wrap up because it's probably time for a break, isn't it? Um, but, uh, yeah. Is that just going to be nice? Yeah. <laughs> cross party, long term. Um, my email address is probably really not very visible, but if you do want to email me, it's just under here. <laughs>